Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us once again for Facebook Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, CEO and founder of Clean Machine. I have a really cool guest on today. Uh, being a vegan business owner myself, her work is really dear to my heart in supporting uh, other vegan entrepreneurs, as I call them, uh, uh, who are out there um, trying to meet the demands, these new demands of a lot of people entering the space and choosing a plant-based or vegan uh, approach to products and services out there. So, um, yes, uh, let me do a little intro here. So, um, our, let me pull up my notes real quick and make sure I'm getting this all right. Okay, so Steve, uh, Stephanie Red Cross West is the founder and managing director of Vegan Mainstream. So Vegan Mainstream offers businesses, uh, marketing and business coaching, uh, consulting and training for vegan entrepreneurs, authors, chefs, personal trainers, coaches, and of course, people like me, vegan business owners. Um, so let's dive into a little bit of where it began. Um, first, your own personal journey in veganism and then how that led to um, further aligning your work with your passion. Yeah, I think my vegan journey started like a lot of people where I was really kind of on this health quest. You know, I was trying to eat healthier, be better and so forth, but I was kind of I guess started on the process initially when I was in college because of a health challenge. You know, I had gotten sick through traveling. I was in a, about three different states over like three different weekends. And um, by the time I got home and when I was a senior in college, I came back and I was just feeling just ill. Um, you know, I was, you know, throwing up, I was doing all that other stuff and my body just wouldn't stop. I got to a point where my body would almost go through the motions of it. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was, my tank was on E at that point <laughs> and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So we went to the emergency room, emergency room said, oh, you're just dehydrated and sent me home. Wow. Um, same thing. I was still going through the process. My body would just act like it was sick. It was trying to purge. It could not stop. So I went back to the emergency room wow. once again. They were like, oh, we don't really see anything. We'll just give you some fluids and send you home. And, you know, I'm a senior in college at this point. You know, I'm not necessarily sure what's really going on. Um, I didn't think it was maybe crazy, you know, a crazy illness or something like that at the time. I just wanted to make sure, you know, everything was OK and there was nothing that I was missing. And I always tell this story because it's pretty ironic. I ended up having like a gynecology appointment on that Monday as this was happening. And, you know, when you're in school, like getting certain appointments was just hard to get. And that was one of those like, you know, hard to get appointments. So I was like, I'm going, even though I feel awful. <laughs> and I went there and she was like, you should not be this sick after going to the emergency room. And I was very fortunate to have someone who kind of stepped up to the plate and said, let's figure out what's going on. Let me go talk to people. And she brought in a couple of doctors. They examined me. They talked to me about what happened. And as they dug into kind of the details, they started asking for a couple samples. And after they'd done some samples, it turned out that I had um, contracted um, E. coli at the time. Wow. I was going to say food poisoning, but yes, that's uh, pretty close. It's one type of food poisoning, yes. And it's interesting that the emergency room didn't pick up on that the first time, but um, it was still in my system. They were still able to do a lot of testing um, and find it. And then that's when everything spun out from there. That's when I learned what it's like when the CDC starts calling you mm -hmm. um, because it's so highly um, you know, contagious and it, it can get into the food stream. You know, They're asking mm -hmm. questions of where I was, where I ate, what time. I mean, it's really pretty extensive what they do. Mm -hmm. And after kind of going through that process, I was a little bit more kind of shocked on what I eat and how it impacts my body and how things can be spread through the items that we eat. And what it started to do is start to get me to kind of pay attention a little bit more. So start mm -hmm. to say, well, what am I putting in my body? What am I putting in my system? Right. Um, where do you get some of these, you know, foodborne illnesses? And some of these illnesses, you know, are not just driven from, you know, meat, plate, meat um, um, byproducts. Um, but the idea is a lot of these 
are born in those environments. And what I started to do is say, well, what if I start taking these things out? What if I started to pay a little more attention? What if I want it to be healthier? What would that look like? And then I started kind of the journey of, you know, taking away beef, taking away, you know, um, certain items from my, from my um, plate and eventually kind of settling on ve uh, vegetarianism for a while. I was, I was one of those vegans for a while that was, you know, I ate a little of this, I ate a little of that, you know, I was using all types of names mm -hmm. to make my food as flexible as I thought I was. Um, and then in 2005, I started kind of spending more time with vegan and vegetarian groups. I was really big on meetups at the time. Mm -hmm. um, at that time, I was living in Danbury, Connecticut, and I had a blast because these groups were just amazing. They were educating me on just so much information. You know, they took me to one of my first like veg fests. We actually caught a train and went up to um, went up to Massachusetts and went to the veg fest there. Um, and I was just blown away from the information. I was just blown away from the environment and really the understanding the difference between being vegetarian and vegan. You know, I thought I was doing so much for the world. I thought I was, you know, I was I was doing the right thing. And then I got educated on, you know, what my choices around dairy, how I was perpetuating, you know, just the lifestyle, the life for these animals and how, you know, for me to have the things I wanted, I was really hurting animals. And I decided that's not what I wanted to do. That's if I want to be healthy, I want them to be healthy. I don't want them to be in environments because of my choices. So I decided that I was going to go vegan and take all of those things out of my diet. So, and then at what point did you say, okay, well, I want to start aligning how I now feel and now see the, the world and my diet with, um, something that you're actually doing and, and turning it into a, a business or a, a, a project that, you know, led to, led to uh, vegan mainstream. It took me a little bit longer. So I went vegan in 2005, but I didn't start vegan mainstream until 2009. Um, at that time or within that time, I'd actually transitioned to a new position. Um, I had worked for corporate America for years. Um, I'd been really fortunate and got a lot of different jobs and promotions. And during that, time, I ended up getting a promotion, which moved me from Connecticut to San Diego, California, um, which is, uh, just California was beautiful, but Connecticut was awesome too, because I was able to go home and see family in Philly. Um, and what happened is when I got to California, it was a different kind of Mecca for a vegan lifestyle. It was a very mm -hmm. different perspective as far as seeing vegan businesses. Um, there was even a local vegan retailer at the time when I was there. Mm -hmm. So I was starting to get not only exposure to different vegan business models, but I was starting to talk to vegan business owners a little bit more. I was starting to understand what are some of the things they were struggling with mm -hmm. and why you know, a business or a restaurant that we thought was just amazing and doing well would two weeks later, all of a sudden just close up shop. Mm -hmm. And as I was having those discussions, I started to realize that there was a need for support, that many of these vegan businesses were great at making food. They were great at sourcing or finding products, or they were great at, you know, whatever their kind of niche was, but the business side was just right. taxing. The business side or getting their hands around it was hard. And what they were struggling with was kind of how do I get that business acumen? And mm -hmm. through my corporate job, that's right. what I got trained to do. I got taught <laughs> yes. how to do the finances and how to do the marketing and you know how to think and scale and how to take expenses out so that the you know the businesses can thrive, but thrive in a well in a way that it it aligns with your values. And you know, I started to start to to dream. Um, and I have an entrepreneur background. I, I, my family had businesses when I was a kid. So I always had that in my blood. And, you know, I was a part of that as, as when I was younger. So it, it kind of started to just come together and start to see as an opportunity for me to work in something that I cared about, something that I was passionate about with individuals that I could relate to. And the idea is, could I bring some of that knowledge, that information, that experience I got from living and being in corporate America for so long um, to the vegan world? Could I help the movement 
in this business channel. But when I started, vegan business was not the buzz it is now. Like, <laughs> oh, it's, it's grown significantly. And, and, and I like what you said, because for me, I was in the corporate world for almost 30 years and um, I had a lot of good experience. You know, I worked with distributors, I worked with uh, manufacturers, I worked with retailers, I worked with uh, brand developers or, or product companies. So I got a really well-rounded experience working in the upper levels of upper level management and seeing how the corporate works, how the strategy works and stuff. But I also did learn things that they were doing that I didn't really want to be a part of. Uh, Top-down management, um, bottom line chasers, where the profits were more important than the product, you know, uh, that marketing was more important than, than the health or performance of the product or efficacy of the product. And I said, you know, this, this, this has got to change. And I also saw that within our sector of business that uh, sports nutrition had turned into this thing that wasn't about sports and wasn't about nutrition really at all. It was about muscle gains at any cost. It was about having the top steroid using athlete on the cover of the magazine. And I'm like, what, what happened? This used to be about fitness. This used to be about health. What happened? The, the industry had gone off in such a bizarre direction that was nothing about health. It was nothing about fitness, really. It was all about ego and about just putting dumping chemicals into it to make it look good, taste good and get you stimulated like you're on crack. And I'm like, what does that got to do with health? And I said, all right, there's got to be not only a better way of presenting the products, but having higher quality products, but also doing it in a in a business model that was collaborative, that was cooperative, that was working with other companies as, as partners instead of competitors, um, not having a top-down style management within companies. So I know when you have ethical personalities, those people that make changes in their life due to their own personal ethic, like veganism or like uh, moving to a plant-based diet, there there needs to be a business structure too that also aligns with that sense of ethical treating people with respect um and 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 not power over people power with people these are different mindsets that you find in a traditional corporate model and i'm wondering how you rise to that challenge in communicating those differences because these are not proven models. Those old models, that top-down model, that, you know, do everything, make the cheapest product you can to make the most profit and spend tons on marketing. That's the old model. And, and people who are ethical, running ethical businesses, um, whether in the greens or, or vegans or, uh, uh, you know, uh, animal rights or protections, they want to run their business the way they feel. And it's not as a proven track record track record. So how did you create some models that more align with them, not just in succeeding as a business in a marketplace that was burgeoning, but also doing it in a way that still aligns through every step of the vegan process. I'd like to talk about that a little bit because that was a learn as I go process for me. <laughs> no, I agree. I think a lot of it is learn as we go. And I still think a lot of it still is because yeah. the industry is still developing, not mm -hmm. just from the standpoint of the types of businesses and products and services, but also the channels, the distribution. There's so much that has to be in place before we get to that kind of status quo place that I think there's still a lot of growth um, and a lot of establishing that that's needed. But I guess the way I approach it is I try not to believe those things are in competition with each other. I think that has been a very, I don't know, I guess I would say methodology that I developed when I was working in the business, that it wasn't necessarily having a profitable comp company meant that you couldn't have an ethical company or that we would approach it as one was against the other. Because right. um, I think sometimes as even vegan business owners, sometimes we can tip the scale too far away from profits. We mm -hmm. can tip too far away from the idea that we have to be in business to make money. Right. Um, you know, the concept of a, a business that 
operates on, you know, without cash is not a business that stays in business long. No. So helping people understand that when you're putting your goals in place, when you're thinking about what's important in your business, when you're thinking about what matters in your business, it's important to make sure that you're really kind of pulling out a couple of different things from some of the best practices that we have seen, but pull out the good out of those things right. um, and then put in that extra kind of vegan goodness level mm -hmm. of how do you run your business? How do you treat your customers? What do people say about your business? What kind of experience do you have? And I'm, I'm really big on the experience. It's something I've been talking a lot about in 2020 mm -hmm. is that I think sometimes we forget that it's not just the product, the price, that the reason why people are choosing certain businesses or brands over others is because of how the experience feels, how they market to them, how they talk to them, how they deliver the product, how they follow up, how they ask for testimonials, like all of that matters on how you do it. And I think a lot of times, it's easy to break our businesses down to like commodities that it's, you know, it's this kind of business or that kind of business. And the reality is your business can be very unique. Your business can be very strong. Your business can have very tight ethics um, and use that as a way to dis distinguish it in the market. Now, the only thing I would say you have to be careful of is sometimes you have to understand the difference between your ethics, like me as Stephanie, and my business is ethics. And I don't know if you ran into this when you ran your business, but I run into this a lot when I coach a lot of vegan businesses because there may be a bar or a perspective that you have personally on what you do. But when you run a business, in my perspective, you run a business in service to your customers, not in service to you. So you have to be careful that everything you do is based on what you want it to be as the owner, as opposed to it has to be valuable, it has to be impactful, it has to be aligned with your customer's values. And therefore, sometimes your customer's values may not be a one-to-one -one with your personal values, because your customers are going to be a little bit more diverse. They're going to be it's not just a one customer. Most of us have multiple customers. So it's going to be a little bit more of a, of a soup um, as opposed to an individual appetizer. Uh, and, and finding, because there are definitely people like myself who want to lead the way and leading the way in a market. Like uh, I was first to market with three of our key ingredients um, in our first product was first to market with a cactus flower nobody else had. Now the challenge is, and I see this in, in many businesses, nobody has ever heard of that cactus flower. Or another one, which is ahi flower. I was the first to market with ahi flower. And one of the most effective um, and amazing omega-3 supplements in the world, but nobody had ever heard of it. So I have the challenge of educating people on what it is, why it's better, and how it's different. The whole value proposition, it's starting from scratch. Now, that, that's a huge challenge that most of the major companies won't do. So that was an advantage in one way and a disadvantage in one way. It, it took longer to build that product and build the education, build the awareness that, wow, this is really proven four times better than anything else out in the market. OK, that's great. When people got that, they stayed with us, which was great. But it took a while to get to that progress. Had I just gone out there with just price point and something familiar to everybody, a commodity skew, I could have made a lot more money, a lot easier, a lot faster. But I want to lead the way. I want to bring some of these plants to market that are unique, that nobody has ever been experienced to, simply because of that reason. They are best in class. And they deserve to be available to the consumer so the consumer can have those but they do have to be educated. And getting that out there can be expensive, can take a lot of time. So yes, for any entrepreneur, you need to understand <laughs> that if you go that route, what are the experiences? If you're looking to get in to serve the public and give them what they want, that's one thing. If you are and I hate I hate when people do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. When you're trying to lead the market, by like the iPhone and give them something they didn't even know they wanted, but 
when they realize what it is and how much better it is than what's on the market, they clamor to it. And I'm hoping that, and, and please forgive me for making a comparison to the, one of the greatest companies in the world, it just in context, is, which is trying to lead the market to something better. That can be a slow, hard, and expensive task. Um, it's rewarding in its own way, and it protects you in some ways because the other big players aren't going to invest in the marketing, aren't going to invest in the education. They want something that's cheap and 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 everybody knows and you put it out there and it tastes good and everybody buys it and they make lots of money. And so it's a different path if you're trying to choose something that is truly better than what's on the market if the consumer is not educated or aware of the value of the product. And that value proposition can be difficult. <laughs> It can, it really can be. But I think it's, I think it's so important to have those unique features and unique way of bringing products and services to market. I really think it's so important, and not just because I love being in the role of yeah, being able to, like you said, be a market leader to really transcend um, an industry. But I also think it creates a level of longevity in a lot of businesses. Mm -hmm. It creates a loyal customer base. It creates a level of trust between you and your customers. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's something that is really just the, one of the most powerful things that you can have in a business where you have kind of a group of people that really believe in what you do. You start mm -hmm. to create almost these ambassadors in the world. Um, around what you do. And I think as vegans, many of us are looking for ways to make improvements, transform and change the world. And I really believe how and what products you bring really can make a difference. Now, yes, it will take longer. Yes, you have to educate. Yes, you're gonna have to be a little bit patient. But when you kind of play the commodity game of just price point by price point, um, it can require you know, there's a pro and con for all these different types of business models, but I tend to lean more towards businesses that people are offering something unique. Um, and I think sometimes people forget to think of their business uniquely. Like I think in your line, you really went into the ingredients and kind of said, I need, I really want the ingredients to be my distinguishing factor. And I also yeah. wanted to make sure that the quality was based on the ingredients. And yeah. I feel like for some people, when they start their business, they want to help, which I think is good. That's the first phase of it. But you do have to take a step back and say, how is your business going to transform your industry? How is your mm -hmm. business going to create a, a space for it? You know, mm -hmm. so it's an actual, it takes up residency in your industry. How are you going to help people distinguish? So while it takes a lot of time to educate, mm -hmm. if you can't distinguish your product from A, B, or C, when a right. customer is trying, is sitting in a store, they're gonna struggle. Yeah. They're just gonna move their hand back and forth and only get to like the eeny, meeny, miny, mo that we did as kids. You know, yeah. they're gonna start to yeah. kind of just, you know, choose. And if you want someone to go through the process of choosing your product every time. If you want someone to hire you as the coach or consultant every time, if you want someone to come to your website for the recipes, for the latest cookbook, for mm -hmm. the latest even innovation in recipes every time, it's important to have that distinguishing factor. Um, it's not just a wow factor, but it's a distinguishing factor that's mm -hmm. in the roots of your business. So I commend you for doing it because mm -hmm. it's hard work. But <laughs> definitely, I think it's so important. And I think also these days it's getting a little bit easier because mm -hmm. more and more of our marketing channels are allowing us to talk directly to the customer. Yes. And that, that has been such a godsend for us as a company. You know, I remember a conversation when I was so excited about ahi flour because you had published studies 400% more effective than Flex, which is the number one selling plant-based omega-3 on the market. And I'm like, this is four times better, clinically proven, published human study. The market's going to go crazy for this. So I went to one of the biggest buyers for one of the biggest retailers of supplements in the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, I presented to him and he said, 
yeah, that's a problem. And I said, what do you mean? How's that a problem? It's, it's the best by far. Mm -hmm. And, and he says, that is the problem. What am I going to do with all the product on my shelf that now yours is better when it's not going to sell that would hurt my sales. And I'm like, wow, wait a minute. I'm just presenting you with the best known omega three backed by research. And you're not bringing it in because of that, because it's all about the sales to them. It's all about the profits. And I, and I get it. You know, he was just a buyer, his employee, he's got a job to do. And his job is to make his company that he works for money. That's I get it. I was a buyer too, for many of those companies. So, um, but, but that's such a disservice to the consumer then the consumer doesn't have access to the best products out there because the retailers. So the retailers were controlling the marketplace for, for what was in the marketplace. And the, these unique, wonderful, better, best in class products were never even reaching the marketplace uh, because they were, they were pushed out. You know, the people that were already selling more gained up, gobbled up all the shelf space. And with the advent of the internet, and with direct marketing and digital marketing direct to consumers, letting consumers directly know, either through social media or influencer marketing or digital marketing, paid uh, marketing efforts. Also, Amazon. Amazon has been huge for us. You know, we're over 300% growth on Amazon right now because we have access. We can talk directly to the consumer. We can show them what they have the opportunity to buy and let them make the decision for themselves. I love that. I mean. To me, there's never been a better time to be an ethical entrepreneur and and get products that really can make a difference out there because you have access to the market like like none in my lifetime. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, because when you know when I came up in marketing, it was telemarketing, you know, it mm-hmm. was you know, very it was direct mail, direct mail was huge. Uh, yeah. I used to do marketing campaigns where we would drop anywhere from like three to four million in direct mail campaigns. And it was, I mean, it was really a huge operation, you know, and how to make changes and phone numbers. And, you know, we'd have all these different variations of phone numbers and track the phone numbers. So people weren't even going to the website. They were literally dialing the 1-800 number. So I or, remember- or catalog like, business, right? Huh? <laughs> Even catalog business, right? The old school catalog. Yeah. So this environment has really kind of changed everything because um, you don't have the cost of things like direct mail. You don't need a call center to make all these phone calls. Um, So now that we can email people directly, that makes a big difference. Now that we can do sessions like this where Facebook Live, we can broadcast you know, we don't have to go through traditional broadcasting tools. So this really is such an amazing time to start a business, even if, even now, I want to say even in 2020, because I think for a lot of people, they get very nervous right now about starting a business, running the business, managing their business. And, you know, unfortunately, I don't know if you've experienced this as you've been talking with people, but, you know, there's a good amount of people that I've talked to that feel like they're waiting it out. And when I say waiting it out, mm-hmm. they're doing the digital stuff reluctantly. Right. <laughs> they're like, yeah, yeah, I'll do some of this stuff. But they're almost <laughs> like, I can't wait until we can get back to doing this. I can't wait until we get back to doing that. And I really think it's such an important time right now in businesses for us to really understand this digital landscape mm-hmm. and create these digital channels for businesses. So in that aspect, I know you've had some amazing guests. Thank you for having me as one of your guests, by the way. But um, you've had some incredible guests on your podcast, too. If uh, For all of you out there listening, you should definitely check out Stephanie on her podcast. Incredible guests. If you're really interested in learning more about the whole um, entrepreneurism and, and how to approach things, her guests have really valuable information. Um, but for big entrepreneurs, if they've got some ideas or whatever, where do you see the growth really happen? Where do you see a good entree, uh, entry point for people to get into the business? What applications, what products and services are really um, growth? And, and in that, um, even investors, not only uh, entrepreneurs, but also investors, where do you see a lot of that growth and, and uh, energy and financing going? 
I mean, it's really still, I guess in my mind, the market's still not that mature yet. Right. You know, we still, you know, don't walk into stores and have alternative options for many of the products that we buy, or there's one alternative or two right. alternatives. Right. Um, so there's really a lot of growth opportunity out there. What I think where people are starting to do a good amount of focus these days is look up the entire supply chain. So mm. where in the past we might've said there was great growth in vegan clothing, but mm. the question now becomes is let's make sure we're looking at the entire supply chain for this mm -hmm. clothing and saying, what kind of materials do we need to have so that we can innovate in clothing and fashion? What type of raw materials are we getting and how are we sourcing them from an environmental standpoint or sustainability standpoint? How do we make some of that change so that not only can we offer vegan options that are not impacting animals, that are not um, impacting um, and causing you know, death um, in, in our world, what we also want to do is make sure that this product becomes something that's sustainable. You know, it's not made from from plastics and oils. You know, it's not made. We're not we're not creating another problem while we're solving um, one problem or one challenge. And I think that's one place that I find there's really great growth. The only challenge with that, as far as starting a business there, um, is it does require a little bit more coordination, working with other industries and so forth. So it might be a little bit more of a a slower burn business, you know what I mean? You know, a business that will catch fire in time, but it may not be the business if you're trying to, you know, if you've been if you've been laid off this year or if you've been in a situation mm -hmm. where you need to make some extra money, that may not be your your 2020 <laughs> new right. business game plan. Um, but I definitely see that happening for investors and so forth. I think for individuals that are starting businesses, often I tell people to start where you have your expertise. And your expertise could be in your current job, or your expertise can be something that you maybe never fully moved from hobby land into a business. Right. Um, and, 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 you know, I do some consulting too with uh, people. And, you know, one of the big things that I see most commonly is they don't understand pricing structure. <laughs> that you have to build in margin for each level of, of the cost that goes into it. And when I show them a real cost and real um, bill of lading model that includes all of the exploded costs that goes into it, they're like, okay, I'm not profitable. And I'm like, exactly, you know, or, you know, they say, oh, okay, well, this is my product and it's, it's the best in the market. And then I'm like, oh, it's $14. And the average selling price in your category is $350 okay, that's not going to sell. <laughs> and they're like, but wait, it's the best. And I'm like, yeah, but they're not going to see that price point as, as something that they're willing to pay. So teaching them value and valuations of their products, teaching them pricing model, how to build it in. If you're if you have a retail goal in mind, as opposed to a direct to consumer, very different pricing models and stuff like that. So where do you see some of the biggest things that most people come to you because um, I really want to suggest for those that want to start a business is do one of two things, either partner with somebody who has that type of expertise, that real in-depth on job training expertise and background, or go to a consulting group like uh, Vegan Mainstream and, and work with those people that can give you that head start and not have you make those initial mistakes I've seen people invest a lot of money in companies and not even start with the basics and then had to go back and restart and do it all over again. Tens of thousands of dollars wasted in getting to that, you know, oh, I've got a product. And it's like, but the pricing is wrong. The ingredients are wrong. You know, that won't pass. You know, your claims are wrong or not legal and stuff like that and have to start all over and lose all that money. And some just like don't have it. They burn out of money at that time. So budgeting, pricing, those things. What do you see as the most common things that give people a leg up? And I know you don't want to give away your best secrets, obviously. <laughs> That's uh, but what are some of the common things that people make a big mistake? Because I I really want to see more ve vegan businesses succeed. I yeah. think a lot of people have great ideas and great products or great services, but don't understand, like you said in the very beginning, the business model. 
And if you don't understand the business model and you don't succeed, how can you benefit others? And I think in the heart of hearts, most of the people who are in ethical businesses and vegan businesses really have a drive to want to help benefit other people. And the more successful you are and more profitable are, that means the more you can grow, reach more people, be uh, allow more of your products and services to be had by more people so you can be a more benefit to people. We have to have a successful business model too as well. So what are some of those things that you see real commonly? I think one of the common mistakes is that people feel that they should just grind, like this concept of like grinding it out, you're just going to work, 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 work. You're just going to put all the money into the business. And one day it's going to work out. <laughs> one day the numbers and everything is just going to fall in line and you're going to get that big lucky break. And what I worry about is I think people are, when they're listening to stories of vegan business, business owners, not vegan business owners, but entrepreneurs, people that have made it, they don't listen to people's backstories. They don't realize that many of your most successful entrepreneurs often have had one or two other business ventures that actually have failed right. um, or business ventures that had a huge kind of threat to them. And they had to make a major change, major kind of shift in their business for them to survive. So I really think that there's a little bit of kind of grounding people that needs to happen mm -hmm. so that you understand that you're in business now. It means you have to, like you were saying, run the numbers. And one thing that I also find that people do is they keep it all in their head. And I'm like, you can't run numbers and have a budget in your head. You can't say, well, I make money. And what people tend to do is they start to look at their bank account and say, well, there's money in my bank account. So <laughs> I'm making money. <laughs> which is a very, <laughs> you know, it's an incorrect way of running a business um, right. because cash flow is very different than profit. Yes. Um, and how cash is moving in and out of a bank account um, is really not a measure of the health of your business or an individual product. So what I tell a lot of people to do is take the ideas they have in their head and put them on paper. Because if they don't make sense on paper, they're probably not going to make sense when you execute them. Oh. So if you put your product on paper and to your point, you get to a $14 product and everything else in the market is at $348. I don't <laughs> want you to just go to market and say miraculously, it's going to work its way out. Right. We have to make it make sense on paper. We have to make sure that you are generating a margin in your product. We have to make sure that there's even some basics around the financials where the question is, are you making enough money to reinvest in the business? And then are you making enough money to even pay yourself, your employees and more? Or even if you're starting out as a solopreneur and yes, you're doing everything, you know, you're flipping the pancakes, you're making the batter, <laughs> you're going to the post office, that's great. But that product in the long term or that service that you're offering in the long term cannot have one person with six arms running it. Right. So you have to build a financial model that's going to work when you're going to hire someone. Right. That has to work where you're going to have a team. And it can be a small streamlined team. I don't make it sound like, I mean, without maybe a VC, you know, you may, if, you're, if you're growing your business on your own, you may grow it with one employee or freelancers and work your way up. But you can't build a product with zero labor cost, with zero contractor cost, with zero payments. And I think people don't realize that um, these things ha should be planned, they should be documented. And you really need to get, one of the things I even tell a lot of people to do is not only work with a coach like someone like myself, but get a sounding board of people. And your mm -hmm. sounding board of people should have certain skills. So even if you don't have a partner, say you are doing it as a solopreneur, make sure you have a sounding board that supports you. And one person is your financial sounding board. Another person is maybe your marketing or communication sounding board. Another person is maybe a person that teaches you leadership and helps you rise up. Because some of us are you know, have some edges to us when we first start our businesses <laughs> and having someone tell you when that's not a big deal. That's the way a business works. And you're like, oh, I was all puffed up and had my arms crossed. <laughs> they tell you, it's okay. You can let that one go 
you need someone to help you get reality checks. Yeah. And I think sometimes if we live in our, our businesses, we live in our business bubble. Mm -hmm. And therefore, mm -hmm. we can bypass things like the financials. We can bypass things like how do you really communicate? How often do you communicate? What is the style? Where do you spend money? If you don't have revenue coming in, it doesn't make sense to create this $5,000 advertising budget um, because how are you going to sustain that? You can bypass those things when you're in your own bubble, but when you open it up to a sounding board, when you open it up to a coach, you have someone to kind of present that idea to, and therefore they can let you know if it will float, if it has some serious issues and needs to go back in the oven because it hasn't been baked completely, yeah. um, or if it's ready for a potential trial. Well, this is such that's such great information, and you're you're a wealth of information, both from your own experience and your passion for helping others. So, how can people get in contact with you if they want to learn more? I know you have podcasts, but you also have tutoring programs. You have one-on-one -on -one coaching. You've got, you know, uh, so many different avenues that you can help people in different varying uh, aspects. Um, tell them how they can reach you at um, Vegan Mainstream and or on social media. Absolutely. So you reach us at our website, veganmainstream.com. We're also on all social media channels, so whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, we're even on Pinterest. And I'm getting my act together and getting to going to jump into TikTok. We have the we have the cool. channel set up, but I haven't been doing much. But um, we definitely are accessible in all those ways. And a lot of what we try to do, just like you said, we try to coach and support people, but we also try to offer some free services for people who are in that planning stage when you're starting to kind of understand. So we do things like free webinars um, and so forth. But then we also do things like um, online training um, to help people kind of walk through that process with us and walk through it even as a group of other people who are in these training courses and workshops and so forth. So we try to give people a little bit of different types of ways to get the support that they need um, and in kind of different kind of channels as far as cost so that um, it works for you as your business is growing. That's awesome. And again, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for what you're doing and supporting vegan businesses. I wish, you know, 10 years ago when we started this company, Clean Machine, that there were people like you around. I mean, for, I was fortunate enough to have a lot of uh, on-the-job training experience and was able to uh, extrapolate all that and use it to help build the, the company that we have now. But as you said, a lot of it is learn on the go because this is a new industry. This is a fledgling um, uh, niche that is, is rapidly growing. So it's rapidly changing. And then, of course, you have market changes, too, that are happening like the pandemic or like the shift from uh, retail, brick and mortar retail to e-commerce. So there's a lot of challenges that are going on dynamically that you know, great services. Thank you for supporting vegan businesses. And um, uh, I look forward to having more conversations with you in the future because uh, you just are, are offering some uh, great benefits to other people. So thank you. And thank you for coming on the show. Thank you.